thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, present this paper. Um, I'd like to begin for uh, the Vietnam veterans in the room for uh, by recognizing that it's Vietnam Veterans Day today, uh, a new national holiday to recognize our veterans. And so, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your service to those, uh, those uh, veterans here today. Um, so, as uh, as uh, Chris said, I am a uh, I am an Army Colonel for a few more months, um, getting ready to retire. I'm also an adjunct uh, professor of Benedictine um, College. Um, before I start, because I am an active duty officer, I do need to uh, I need to, need to say that uh, the views I'm going to express here are my own. I'm not sure exactly what the uh, Army's policy is on uh, domestic politics in the Vietnam War, but whatever it is, you're not going to hear it here today. This is uh, just my opinion. So, um, the, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, kind of a side, uh, a side issue to the uh, topic of my dissertation, which was the uh, domestic politics of the Vietnam War. Uh, while I was doing uh, particularly research at the uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, Library, I uh, found this kind of this uh, <coughs> folder kind of stuffed in the back of a box uh, about uh, the uh, Johnson administration's efforts to forge uh, relationships with private uh, organizations that could help them sell the war to the American people. And I thought it was a fascinating topic, but there wasn't room in the book. And so um, when I had the opportunity to write this paper, I, I was excited to do, to do so because I think it's a really fascinating topic. So before we, uh, before we talk about those efforts, uh, a brief review for those folks in the room who weren't alive through the Cold War or were young uh, during the Cold War, uh, what was the Johnson administration trying to sell? And so, uh, at, at its core, the Johnson administration was trying to connect the Vietnam War to the broader Cold War. And their argument was that the Vietnam War was communist aggression to expand communism in the Southeast Asia. And so, to understand why that was so threatening to the United States and to NATO and to the West, you have to understand World War II. Uh, the generation that was leading the nation had just come out of World War II, um, and 60 million people died, you know, 2 to 3% of the population of the planet. And so nobody wanted another world war. And the, the uh, historical narrative that had evolved up to the war, after the war was that appeasement was what had caused the war. And that's a picture of Neville Chamberlain <coughs> holding his peace agreement with Hitler, uh, forged over uh, Czechoslovakia, where they basically uh, ceded that uh, Hitler could take the sedate land in exchange for peace. And the narrative that had emerged in the years since this horrible war was that appeasement feeds aggression. aggression. And so aggression had to be faced head on uh, when it happened. And so when uh, the Soviet Union uh, refused to uh, withdraw from those territories that it had occupied at the end of World War II in Eastern Europe, uh, when China, uh, uh, when the communists in China took over the country and uh, ran out the nationalist government, when uh, the Chinese got their own nuclear weapon, when um, the North Koreans invaded uh, South Korea, all of those things were seen through the lens of a communist plot hatched in Moscow and Peking to expand uh, communism uh, across the world. And so really anything uh, that, the communi that any communist country did or any communist faction did was seen through that lens. And so when uh, after the breakdown of the, uh, the, treaty, uh, the 1959 treaty that ended the French into China war, um, and the North uh, began supporting an insurgency in the South, a communist insurgency in the South, immediately that was seen by, the, by successive administrations as communist aggression to uh, take over Southeast Asia. And so the doctrine that emerged from that is uh, what was colloquially known, colloquially, colloquially known as the domino theory, which is that uh, the, the South Vietnam is the cork, on, cork in the bottle, and if South Vietnam should fall, all of the other countries of Southeast Asia would call, fall to communism like dominoes, like the pictures. Uh, this is a cartoon out of a newspaper from the time. And so uh, the idea is that uh, uh, you know, this idea of military containment 
of communism, this idea that the, the West has to be prepared to use military force to meet aggression, um, uh, meet uh, communist aggression to stop the, the expansion of communism around the world. And that is, the, that is what the Johnson administration was trying to quote unquote sell the American people when uh, the war deteriorated to a point uh, where they believed that the South was ready to fall uh, to uh, communism. And so I'm going to be showing this uh, slide a couple times throughout, uh, throughout the, uh, the presentation as I talk about the different efforts that the Johnson administration used to try to sell the war. Um, the first period that we're talking about here is really uh, the spring and summer of 1965. And during this period, um, really the war is beginning to become Americanized. I don't have time to go into it in great detail, but the... Uh, um, the administration has, uh, in response to uh, what they see as communist uh, aggression in the South, uh, progressively began to uh, more directly act in the war between uh, South and North Vietnam. Um, after a supposed attack on American destroyers uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin, the president got a resolution from Congress uh, authorizing him to use any force necessary to protect South Vietnam. He, uh, and he bombed the North. And then after some uh, uh, Viet Cong attacks in the South at a play coup and at a, Kui, um, at a hotel in Quai Non, um, he initiated a bombing campaign that's called, uh, it's called Operation Rolling Thunder, which really continued for years. And it was a sustained bombing campaign with the objective of uh, bringing, bringing the North to the peace table and uh, ending what they perceived as communist aggression. So during this time, uh, the, the real opposition, the anti-war movement, the nascent anti-war movement at the time, came from two areas. The first was academia. Uh, starting, in, uh, starting in that spring, um, there were a series of teach-ins, uh, a big one, at, uh, one of the most prominent ones at uh, University of Michigan. Um, also, there was a meeting of Asian scholars in San Francisco in April 1965. And then the most prominent, and that's actually a uh, that's actually their bulletin, their uh, their agenda, uh, was the national teach-in um, in, in May 1965, uh, which drew luminaries like uh, Hans Morgenthau, Mary Wright, George uh, Cahan, and uh, uh, McGeorge Bundy from the administration was going to speak at it, but once they realized how many uh, how many scholars they were piling up against him, he decided to just send a letter. Um, the other picture there is of uh, uh, a protest by the Students for Democratic Society, which was a student organization that was uh, very active uh, in opposing the war uh, once the, it became Americanized. And so the first effort to outsource uh, and sell the war was really uh, a partnership between the administration and the American Friends of Vietnam. American Friends of Vietnam was a uh, was a American organization that had really been advocating for more direct U.S. intervention in the uh, Vietnam War, really since uh, uh, since the early '60s. And so um, there there were several elements to this partnership. On the on the uh, administration side, you had uh, Jack Valenti, uh, Chester Cooper, who were two uh, advisors to the president, uh, who were really directly involved. Um, they had a, a number of initiatives, a couple of the big ones in the interest of time, were uh, sending students to Vietnam. They ended up sending 19 students to Vietnam to come back and then tell the papers that everything was going swimmingly in Vietnam uh, to kind of sell the war. Um, and uh, the, the American Friends Vietnam also published a, a number of pamphlets and uh, uh, distributed those. The uh, Public Affairs Bureau at the State Department was also actively giving stuff to the American Friends of Vietnam for them to distribute. Um, and uh, the American Friends of Vietnam also established a uh, Speakers Bureau with uh, prominent speakers who could talk authoritatively at uh, local meetings and at national meetings on the topic, and hopefully at teach-ins. Uh, the biggest, uh, most visible effort was in uh, June 1965. Uh, the Vice President and uh, Carl Rowan, who was the uh, USIA, the uh, um, United States Information Agency Director, uh, they actually spoke at Michigan State University, just down the road from University of Michigan, which I'm sure was a complete coincidence, uh, 
in order to uh, sell the war. It was, and uh, the AFV made sure that the room was packed with a friendly audience for that uh, discussion. But really that uh, effort sort of fell apart because they didn't, they didn't have a way to fund the effort uh, from the government because that would require a congressional authorization. authorization. And so the, the, the effort really died on the vine. And so the next effort followed quickly after, um, which was the uh, uh, U.S. Joint uh, or the U.S. Uh, Junior Chamber of Commerce. And uh, during this period, uh, in July, he was going to introduce ground troops in uh, direct combat. Um, and a, the new opposition that was emerging was uh, Senator J. William Fulbright. He had ushered the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution through Congress, thinking that it was just a resolution to scare the North, having no idea that that was going to be the foundation for a war. And so when the President announced he was going to introduce uh, ground combat troops, uh, he began to openly speak against uh, the policy in Vietnam. So uh, the JC's effort was really uh, pretty short-lived. Uh, the Chula Vista chapter in California of the JC's uh, of their own volition, uh, did a poll of their, or did a petition drive in their town of 50,000, got 10,000 signatures in support of the war. They offered that to the, to the president, and the president uh, and, the, and his administration uh, uh, used that as a basis to reach out to the national chapter. And, but that really did not, um, that really did not bear fruit, and it died pretty quickly on the bond. The next effort was uh, the, uh, the administration actually established uh, what they called the Committee for an Effective Durable Peace in Asia. You had uh, ground action uh, picking up. This is actually a picture of the Battle of Idrang Valley, um, which was made famous and uh, we were soldiers, but the war had really picked up. The American public was absolutely paying attention and uh, support for the president's policies were starting to wane. And so, uh, with that, uh, with that growing unrest about the policy, the president or uh, the uh, SDS started uh, a, a uh, was able to um, was able to uh, get a larger demonstration going in uh, October of uh, 65. 40 cities there were uh, protests against the war, and then in November there were 20,000 uh, 20,000 demonstrators showed up in Washington to protest the war. But as this cartoon shows, this is out of a paper at the time. Uh, Americans were uh, not very sympathetic to the protesters, and a lot of them thought that they were communist sympathizers. And so uh, the effort uh, basically drew a bunch of national security figures, including Arthur Dean, who had been a, a Korean War negotiator, uh, Dean Acheson, former Secretary of State, and Thomas Gates, uh, former Secretary of Defense. Um, and they did do a full page ad, ad in the New York Times, but uh, really, those, all those luminaries wanted to be involved in the policy, not just selling the war. And so it fell apart because McGeorge Bundy, who had been in charge, put in charge of the effort, was really not able to keep them all saying the same thing in support of the administration. And so uh, the administration really uh, gave up on this whole public-private partnership until 1967. In 1967, casualties were really starting to mount. The Army was starting to do large-scale uh, operations and uh, it was real and uh, the the really just public fatigue with the war uh, support was starting to wane. In 1966, the uh, the Senate had started it held hearings on the war and uh, you had even larger demonstrations. Uh, um, in October of 67, 200,000 protesters showed up in Washington, and so uh, the the. The administration was desperate, desperate to drum up support and decided to uh, re-engage a private organization. And because they had this previous model with the, the earlier committee, um, they decided to establish another committee, a uh, Committee for Peace with Freedom uh, in Vietnam. And uh, the, the key mover was John Roche, who was a uh, presidential advisor. Um, he had contacts, he had administration contact with Walt Rostow, uh, uh, Dean Russ, the Secretary of State, and uh, uh, Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, but he was also communicating with this committee that supposedly was a spontaneous effort by concerned citizens. 
Uh, some of the, you know, the, uh, Eisenhower and Truman were the honorary chairman, but uh, Paul Douglas was the, uh, the official, was kind of the day-to-day -day head. Uh, General Omar Bradley was an outspoken uh, member of the group, and uh, Dean Acheson and uh, Thomas Gates participated in this committee as well. And uh, this got a lot more, a lot more attention. And two key rhetorical things that came out of this, I think, are the enduring legacy. The first is uh, when they announced, they said that they were representing the great silent center of the American people, not the protesters, you know, in contrast to the protesters. And uh, the second thing that the, uh, when they announced, uh, they repeatedly used the phrase peace with honor in their literature to talk about their objectives for being <coughs> And of course, uh, all of those things would show up again during the Nixon administration, which I think is the, the enduring significance of this. Uh, in November 1969, uh, President Nixon would give, or would give his famous silent majority speech, and there are a lot of conflicting, uh, conflicting stories about where that came from, but it would have been impossible for anybody engaged in the public debate to have missed uh, this, this repeated rhetorical device of the silent center that was used uh, by the Committee for Peaceful Freedom. He also adopted this practice of uh, surreptitious ties to supposedly private organizations. That picture of Nixon and Bob Hope. Bob Hope uh, uh, ran this, uh, this uh, organization called Unity Week, which in 19 November 69, held these big rallies in support of, Amer of uh, Nixon's war policy. Um, surreptitiously, the Nixon administration was uh, funneling them information, funneling them money, and funneling them support. And then you'll see John, you see John P. O'Neill down there, and that's a newer picture, but he was a uh, member of the uh, uh, Vietnam veteran, uh, the Vietnam veterans uh, organization that was pro-war. And he was, you know, he was several times in the office of Nixon uh, comparing notes. And uh, of course he would go on to be the leader of Swiss, Swift Boat Veterans uh, against uh, John Kerry during his election. And so with that, uh, thank you again for uh, asking me to be here.